With all doubts, I think it's by far the best thing in the world. How dare you score like that in the Premier League? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of ASTV's Premier League show, Match Week 12 Review. Can't believe we are already 12 match weeks in. I can't believe it's November 25th, and I guess while we're at one, I can't believe it's not butter. No, I, I can't believe that Thursday is already Thanksgiving, and we will be into December uh, within just like a short whisker of a toss. So, what also I can't believe is Paul Bickler is back in the house after two weeks out, missing uh, podcast 300 and 301. Uh, good to see that you come rolling back in for a Premier League show, you know, on City capitulating and Liverpool taking victory laps. So thanks for coming back now after the stress is gone. Yep, very on brand for me to miss all the major milestones in my life. <laughs> it's true. It is very, very true. So... Uh, we'll get right into it here. You know, the Premier League's been a crazy place uh, the last few weeks. Obviously, we have City going through the struggles they're going through. Liverpool just keep trucking along. You know, arguably as competitive of a league as it's been. Like, people have talked about the Premier League being the most competitive league. And I've been on the podcast and talking about how if it wasn't for Jurgen Klopp, Man City would have literally turned the Premier League into Liga. Uh, and PSG winning it every year. If it really wasn't for Klopp, like even just challenging in those years against City, outside of the one underlying Maurizio Sarri Chelsea year, right? Like there haven't really been any other titles during the Guardiola reign, but we have to start. I think if you're going to talk about the biggest story right now happening, it isn't Liverpool being clear at the top of the table. I think the biggest story in the Premier League right now is Manchester City. So, you know, I'll ask you, Paul, the same question I ask on the graphic. Like, is it just a wobble or is this something bigger? And I specifically use this image because I felt like this image, this image sort of speaks, in my opinion, to what's going on at City. Like, you have Foden arguing with, like, the match officials at the end of a match. You have Pep basically consoling Gundogan. I think because he's trying to like remind him that it's not his fault that he brought him back to city and he wanted out of Barcelona because, you know, I saw an, a, uh, a stat the other day. It was like, what could go wrong when you bring a guy back? And like I gone to one's 20, 24, 25 campaign is exactly what can go wrong if you let a legend leave and bring him back. So, um, Answer the question, I guess, Paul. Is it just a wobble? Is it something bigger? Or can it maybe be a mixture of both? Well, it can be a mixture of both. But, I mean, I think we're in, we're in unprecedented territory, right? I mean, we were last week when Pat hadn't ever lost three in a row, let alone four, right? So, I think – I think we're in, I think we're sort of in uncharted territory here. So I think it's obviously, I, I think it's more than a wobble. Um, I, I think the striking thing to me is if you just look at that bench from, from yesterday's match, you just look at the, the roster in that bench that is so uncity like and has been so uncity like. Um, we've talked in the past about how they've done a good job of sort of nurturing a lot of academy products and giving them spot starts into the lineup on kids that are special. That's how Foden cracked the lineup. But we never saw a, a city side. That was a bench that was three-fourths academy. We just never have seen that. Um, when you look at that midfield and you've got, you know, you've got Lewis who's relatively new on the scene. He's not a, you know, he wasn't brought up as your traditional mid You've got a 34-year-old Gundogan who has a second term with the team next to a Silva who's always played better in more attacking wider areas than he has when he's been asked to play a recessed midfield role. Um, and then you look at the pieces that are out. And the pieces are out. There's numerous pieces out, but the two big ones are De Bruyne and Rodri, which are the two pieces that this side has always built themselves around. So – I think it's a I think it's an amalgamation of a lot of things. I think they're two linchpins, they're two big 
the two big pieces being out. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, I'm still not sure. Like if you were to give Pep a true serum, I'm sure I'm not sure that he's a hundred percent happy or convinced that he's getting what he thought he would be getting out of Holland at this point with what's around him. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you on Holland. I think they're a one dimensional side, both scoring goals through Holland and the over resilience and reliance they have on Rodri. Um, it may be a mental thing too. I think the other part is is these are a couple of the stats. I was I was listening to some stuff today. This is what comes with when you have a 90 minute commute in both directions on Mondays. Um, you listen to a whole bunch of more stuff than you would have uh, normally. So I'll give a little credit to others on some of these stats, but these things jumped out at me. Um, if I asked you, Paul, what player has logged the most minutes for Manchester City all competitions this season, you would say? Oh, I don't know. Is it? You uh, think it should be Holland, or you think it should be? Yeah, I would Foden. Think, it's clearly not Foden. We know that because he. Mar- got Marvin thinks stuff. it's somebody like Kovacic, but he's been out. So like, but like you'd think, right? Yeah. It, even if it was like, if you said yeah. Kyle Walker or Ederson, yeah, it isn't even the goalkeeper. The player who has played the most minutes in all competitions, for the greatest, most lucrative club in the world, is one other. Than Rico Lewis. Hell yeah. And to me, that represents yeah. like one of their major problems. Now, some of that's health. Some of that is, is that they have world-class players who, while we talk about players playing way too many minutes for their countries and, and, and when you don't have, you know, the end of seasons and you don't get off seasons, that also happens when you play deep into Euros because you're big key players for your country. So like, I don't want to like, diminish the fact that a lot of big clubs have probably have a player who surprisingly has the most minutes. Here's another one for you. So obviously we know that Holland is their leading score. Who is their second leading goal scorer? Um, I'll go with Doku. It is a center back playing left back in Guardiola with three yep, in all counts. Sense. At this point of any other season, Riyad Mahrez would have already scored 10 goals and people would still be saying he wasn't as important as like a winger coming off the bench. And I think that to me is the big difference with this side. They sold Alvarez. The only semblance they had to a backup striker or Mm -hmm. a backup to Kevin De Bruyne. And they got nothing to replace him. Savino, really good player. But let's be honest. He's a marginal buy for a, a club like City with the actual, like, what he's shown so far. He still has no goals or assists in the Premier League. So, though he's a good player, is he, like, he isn't the type of buy that City usually buys when they need an attacking player. They go get the $60, $70 million winger. If it doesn't work out, we'll sell them in a year or two for a little profit or a little loss, but we'll be okay. This starts to feel like some people think the whole PEP contract is admission that the 115 isn't going anywhere. I think it's the opposite. I think PEP signed this contract because we all know if PEP wants to say at the end of the year, I did everything I could. I signed this deal because I wanted to be here, but it's not working. Look how bad it went. We finished fourth. I'm going to walk away. He can walk. And if they get found guilty, he can leave. No one's ever going to begrudge him. To me, this felt like a, this felt like a, like the last gasp, like a husband trying to like keep a marriage together. This felt like the last hurrah of a boss trying to save his job. Like this felt like I'll sign that contract and maybe the guys will all rally. And then they go out and put in maybe their one, one of their most abject failure performances. I can't remember a city side that looked worse than what I saw against Spurs. They weren't good at Anfield when Ox scored the two goals, but we ran them off the pitch. We were great. 
Spurs were good, and we shouldn't take anything away from Spurs, especially coming off losing to Ipswich at home. When you do that, you it's basically the definition of Spursy. Good and bad. That is the definition of Spursy. Yep. But like Spurs do deserve credit because they took it to City and they never let they never let City believe they were in the game, which is just borderline insane. So is this down to more about like Kyle, the, the wheels have come off Kyle Walker at the wrong time. Pep won't stop relying on these tried and true players that aren't delivering. You know, even at this point, it's, you know, he had Doku, Grealish, uh, Savino, Foden, and De Bruyne on the bench to start this match. And they can't score. Yeah, I, I think this is just the apex of an like I feel like for two seasons now we've we've said like this this squad is getting older, it's thinning. And I think this is just the apex of it. And I think I think Rodri was like I think the Rodri injury was sort of like the, the big domino, right? But I think the I think the Bruyne's inability to stay healthy has been sort of the precursor, right? And I think like you said, this has always been a side that's done good business. And I think you know, we've always said like they've done as good a business like on their exits as they have their their incomings. But I think at the end of the day, like I think they just lost so much. And I think they they failed to, you know, address some of the key pieces they lost, whether it was ever being able to like pick up what they lost in Mares or what was ever being able to like functionally have in the roster what they lost in Alvarez. I just think, you know, the accumulation of age in, in squad numbers and in just their inability to sort of restock. Now, whether that's, I think, I think only time is going to tell like whether this was a conscious plan on their part or whether their hand was forced with what's going on behind the scenes. So I, I think only time will tell that, but I think that's just the apex of something that we've seen. I feel like we've seen this happening for like two and a half seasons now. And we're just finally hitting the apex where they can no longer sort of strain together. And who knows, man, maybe they're going to breathe life into this thing somehow. Maybe there's one more run. Um, we always say they don't lose past the first of the year. So um, fingers crossed they just drop a few more before the first. Yeah, I expect them to – I won't lie. I expect them to strengthen in January if they can spend, if they have the aptitude to spend, like you're saying. You know, the Savino deal, like part of that, which is kind of like rings kind of like conspiracy theorist is, is they they couldn't overspend there because of the profitability laws because of where they were buying from they bought from their own club knowing it would basically all be profit just like it was an academy player and i think that has a lot to do with it i don't think they can spend at the high end of the market right now where they want to spend without selling players and that's going to be a tricky item because you have players that you'd want to sell probably like a Grealish or, you know, you, you just have a lot of dead weight contracts there. And then of course you have Kevin De Bruyne's big deal coming up. And obviously it sounds like he's on his way out. One thing I did want to ask you about is, is we've talked about this in the past. And I think to be fair, we are very critical of Man United whenever we can on this channel and on these podcasts as Liverpool supporters. And we love to rat and, and bang on Bruno Fernandez, right? But to be honest, the fact that Kevin De Bruyne is the club captain at Manchester City, and in my opinion, with about two to three minutes left in that match, after picking up that first random yellow card, he clearly tries to kick out at one moment on a player. And it looks like he almost consciously knows what he's doing. He's so pissed. He's petulant. He's irritated. He's, you know, angry little Kevin. And as he kicks out, I look at it and I think to myself, like, this guy has to know that that's a second yellow and he is missing the Liverpool match. Like, is it just me or – and I'm not saying he was trying to get himself banned from having to play at Anfield next weekend, but are City the type of team that are such the, like, playground bully that if you put them in the corner and you smack them in the mouth, 
And right now, don't kid yourself, losing five in a row on the trot is smacking the bully in the mouth. Like, they almost break down from Holland picking up late yellows to them surrounding the referees anytime the game is close. Like, can this city team actually come back from eight or 11 points behind a team that is mentally superior to them? I don't see the I don't see the fight in this dog anymore. I mean, when I, for for De Bruyne, it was like he even when they were at the top and they were running riot over everybody, right? Even and they were winning league after league. I'd never I, we joked we'd never seen a like a more miserable title winning player than De Bruyne, who always just looked like he didn't want to be there. So I can't imagine he's going to look like he wants to be there right now, right? Um, but like in those teams, whether it's Vincent Company. Uh, or Fernando, or uh, even in, even to some extent, Torway brothers. You know what I mean? They always uh, – David Rodri, Silva. Rodri. Like, they've always had players at the heart of that team that were, were stuck in for a fight, right? Like, those are players that, like, they were street fighters in that team. And, like, I just don't see – outside of Bernardo Silva, who just tends to be more petty than anything, I don't really see a whole lot of that in this side. I mean, look at this side up and down. I mean, Holland, maybe just because he's a big boy, right? But, like, when you look at the side, like, I don't think anybody looks at Gundogan and is, like, scared of a physical, like, that it's just going to be a physical, you know, tough time in the midfield. I don't see that Walker, Akanji, Vardy, Stones. I don't see that any of those guys. Like, I don't see any sort of intimidation um, in that. And I think, you know, like we always said, like, we had never really seen a city side that faced, like, adversity long term and that was always my thing with holland like what does this look like when it doesn't go his way when he gets locked up scoring and like yeah i i think that kind of has been contagious really yeah i i think it's i think we're onto it i think anyone who is ready to just like throw out like write the obituary and throw that last pile of dust down you're a moron because it's november 25th and nothing is decided when there's still 25 plus matches to go that said it's going to take an awful lot if liverpool can and i'm going to probably come back to this tonight at some point when we're asked are we favorites whatever on our on our monday pod but if the if the final tally at the end of the season for points starts with a nine in front of it which wasn't my prediction at the beginning of the year looking at all these teams but if if it's 90 plus points it's gonna be really hard for arsenal or city or chelsea to to get to 90 points with where they're at right now at 22 and 23 after 36 on offer you've already lost 14 of the 107. so like that would basically say that city can't lose four more points Like that, this is the small margins we don't want to talk about yet because it feels like you're getting ahead of yourself, but it's a legitimate, like, but that's on us. That's to make sure that Liverpool doesn't lose two and draw one on a three round bounce, right? Like, because that could happen. Hell, we could lose to City this weekend and then lose to Newcastle and draw at Everton and literally be level on points going into New Year's Day and be like, what the bleep happened? We were up eight. So it'll it'll be really, really interesting to see. So what was also interesting was the week that was VAR. And there were so many decisions in the Liverpool, Southampton, and Chelsea matches that we could spend the entire rest of the program on them. So I don't even know what's the best way to handle VAR this week, other than to say I thought the best part was was that we couldn't have VAR for like 11 and a half minutes in the – Ipswich match because someone in Stockley Park literally pulled the fire alarm and they found out later it was like an intern. And I'm just thinking like they had him like I was like an elementary school kid and I had to put my hand under the little light that would tell you whether you were the kid who pulled the fire alarm. I only know this because well, I was the fucking kid who pulled the I fire was alarm. really I was really rooting for it to be like David Coot. Like, it would have been so awesome if it was David Coote. <laughs> and he did it purely because there was more evidence of him doing yak inside that room. So he had to get in there like like Mission Impossible style and he came through the ceiling. Get his little folder. Lowered himself in <laughs> from the ceiling. And it's Howard Webb just up there 
<laughs> pulling the police. Um, no, um, all seriousness, it was a crazy weekend. Let's start with maybe what I think is one of the most controversial calls, only because I've seen it mixed bag. Like the referees union are all supporting it. The players union are all denouncing it, which usually means that the truth is somewhere right in the middle, right? It's Christian Norgard's red card on Pickford for the play. Like the referees are saying, you don't have to give a red, but giving a red is the right decision because the player has to know he could injure someone by doing what he did. The players are saying he has a chance to score a fucking goal. He's supposed to score the goal. And if the goalie doesn't roll around, we never even look at it with this fictitious video assistant. Where do you roll on this? You know, I'm the former striker like you who got stuck in on a keeper or two in my day. So I'm not exactly feeling bad for him. But where do you come down on this one? Because this one seems like it's really split at almost 50-50. Yeah, I mean, I guess my heart is with the players here. Like, I understand that and I feel like that. But my head is kind of with the refs on the decision just because, like, I think if you go studs in and catch a keeper that high, like, I think it's the height that really gets it for me, right? That's what makes it a red to me is, like, I think if that's lower, it's not as big of a deal for me. The other part is, like, Pickford's involved, so I kind of don't want it to be a red just in general. Yeah, I it, to me it just felt like um, I think it was a situation where you had to give it. I don't love it. Um, it's almost more embarrassing to Everton that they got sixty minutes up a man at home and couldn't score yeah. a goal. Um, good job by Brentford. They yeah. hadn't kept a clean sheet all year long. They decided the best time to do it was with <laughs> ten men at Goodison. Um, another just shot at Everton and Sean Dyche, but. It'll be interesting to see where it goes from there. I personally understood that call. Let's jump over to the Liverpool match where there was literally about eight different things that were reviewed, about three others I think that could have been reviewed. Let's rapid fire these. Um, Robertson's penalty against Dibbling. Personally, I felt like it was close enough that once it was called a penalty on the field, I think it would have been an injustice and an incorrect decision by VAR to change it. Cause I don't think there was guaranteed evidence that that was a mistake though. The foul might've been outside the box from was the foul outside the box in your opinion, or was it on the line? Cause I think depending on what camera angle you watched, it was one or the other. In my opinion, it was outside the box. And in my opinion, the mistake that was made is that it was called a penalty because if, if we're going to look, if like, if like VAR is going to be the line in which like, you know, we're looking for clear definition one way or the other to change that call. I want the change that has to be made to be a penalty versus the other way around because of the, the bar, the VAR threshold. That makes sense. Like to me, it's the same thing with like the offset. Like, I just think that you should always let that go and, you know, call it outside the box. And then if VAR takes a look at it and sees enough that it is clearly a penalty, then I get called over to the monitor. I think that's like, to me, that's how that should have gone through. Yeah. And I, I do understand that. I guess I come back to my whole, my argument all along has been like by giving these guys VAR, it, uh, it in some ways empowers them not to make the tough decision on the field. And I still want referees to try to ref in the moment. And I thought in that spot, he was trying to do that. I still think the foul occurs right near the line and, probably at least his foot is still on him when he crosses the line. And therefore it probably would have been something that bar would have given. I think like, I think it was a penalty. Like I really do. I, I think, I think the foul happens so close drags over the line. The contact occurs continuously through the action and dibbling is driving in on goal and, I mean, we both know it's a terrible See, me, job by Robertson. I just I, think I, I that just felt like the they're foul, calling it either way. I felt like the foul started before the box, and the only time that you call a penalty in the duration of a like the the duration of a foul, like going into dragging the box, them or holding them, like a hold, like we saw a couple weeks ago, right? Like so, for me, that's I don't know. But it's one of those 50-50s. I just think if I'm a ref, I'm making VAR make the penalty decision there based on the placement if it's that close. 
So the red card, uh, potential red card, Lolana on Gravenberch, um, you know, good friend Adam Lolana. We all, I don't think anyone would ever in a million years ever think Adam Lolana is trying to lunge and or hurt a player on a tackle. He's just old and shouldn't be starting Premier League matches. Um, he surely shouldn't be starting Premier League matches against top of the side teams with dynamic midfields. But hey, Russell Martin likes to play Russian roulette, as you saw in the first goal that we scored. Um, should Lulana have been sent off? Were you okay with the fact that it was a yellow originally and it was one of those orange tackles and there's not history and or intent in it and therefore you let it go? Because to me, it felt like one of those ones that didn't need to be given. If it was, I don't think anyone would have argued it. Including yeah, I, Lulana. I agree with you there. I do put this on the calendar, Monday, November 25th, 2024. Probably the first time I've ever agreed with Roy Keane, though, where I thought that a that decision rode pretty much on a player's reputation. 100%. If that's anybody – if that's somebody else not named Adam Lalani who doesn't have great hair and a, and a, you know, shiny reputation, they'd be in probably some trouble there. Oh, if that's Roy Keane? Yeah. He's off. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. If that's yeah. – if that's – well, we'll 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 jump to it. If that's Wilfred Ndidi for Leicester <laughs> – Right, like, and that because yeah. to me, the, maybe the worst call of the weekend is Indeedy's absolute stomp down the Achilles of Palmer and not yeah. being sent off. And I'm gonna just raise my hand and say, call me a fraud because <coughs> I'm Mister Be Fair and Balanced. But I'm also a realist and been watching sports long enough to know there is different treatment for different people, and there's a reason for that. Those people create the TV contracts, create yeah. the buzz in the stadiums, create the revenue that allow for the league to be strong. Don't referees owe it to the Premier League, the one who pay their contracts, their pensions, and their retirement plans? Don't they owe it to protect players like Cole Palmer in this league, players like Mo Salah? It is unbelievable to me that that tackle goes unpunished when it could have taken arguably the second or third most talented and best player and unquestionably the best English player out of the Premier League. Yeah, you have no arguments for me, and I'm sure you have no arguments from Mosal on that either because he's been, you know, he's had five and a half years of getting just the shit kicked out of him on the right wing. Yeah, I just don't like it. I, I I thought the foul was – I don't think Ndidi was trying to hurt the player. I really don't. Yeah. I genuinely think he misses his tackle and he catches him on the back of his leg. But that's the type of tackle that has to get eradicated. Like, yep. you can't have that. Because that's the type of accidental play where the player has no idea it's coming. Right. They don't brace for it. They don't set themselves. And their entire – you know, 18 to 24 months of their career, if not the prime, can be taken away from them. And it's like, I just felt like that one was really, really bad. Um, yeah, and what happens to Chelsea if they lose Palmer, you know? That's a, well, they drop. They, I, they I go mean, from basically being a team fighting to be yeah. second or third. Yeah, that's a side who whose entire livelihood runs through that player right now. <laughs> Well, clearly they were smart enough to leave him off the Europa Conference roster, so they knew <laughs> it was a good idea. Were there any other VAR um, instances or things you recall from the weekend? I, I, you know, there were so many of them. There were, you know, there were there were the goals, there were the handballs, but to me, those were the big ones: the penalty decisions, the the possible red cards. I couldn't really think of any other ones that really were talked about too too much. I think that was the majority of them. Maybe the uh, the bright and second yellow on Believer was just dumb, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's just one of those. I mean, once you get to the second yellow, you can't really review it. So then it's not really a – you know what I mean? It, it ends up being coming one of those talking points that nobody wants. Um, let's take a look at the fixtures here. We already talked a little bit about, obviously, um, Tottenham and City – Brighton-Bournemouth, really interesting match, kind of fun, 
you know, to me, every time I watch these teams, what I realize is that they each have two or three players that are just a class above even right. a really good class team. I think Bournemouth and Brighton are actually better than maybe the level they hold within the Premier League. But I think there's players on their teams that are even better than their club. And I don't I don't think there is a player in the Premier League that is a step below where he should be than Jao Pedro. Like I think Jao Pedro could I think Jao Pedro would have been every bit as good if not a better buy if Spurs had made him their record signing to replace Harry Kane. Like would I you think, if you were City, would you have replaced Alvarez with him? Perfect example. Yep. Prime example of a guy who could have been a I, – I think he could do a job at Liverpool. I think he could have been – I think he would have been a perfect Bobby Firmino type of replacement yeah. to play along the way that we play. It just He does so many things that are so impressive, so good. Um, I think we have to give a second or two here and just credit West Ham. Yeah. Um, Lopetegui was on dire straits, looked like he was on his way out. Team didn't look like they wanted to play for him. He made some changes today. feel like he might have actually, for the first time all year, started his best 11 in a match. And they got a 2 nothing win at Newcastle, which was fully deserved. Like, they could have scored more than that. Um, really good result for Newcastle. And I think... We'd be remiss not to talk about what looks like a Villa team that is just absolutely out of gas at this point. Like, what is it about Villa right now? Are they, is the bloom coming off the rose? I think, you know what I think it is? I think it's a combination of things. I think this is the first, like, I think the Premier League has now gotten a full cycle of what Unai Emery likes to do with this side. So I think that's, I think it's kind of like, I think this is similar to what started to happen with Liverpool, you know, when like people had gotten multiple rounds of Jurgen just running the rails off them. I think they're starting to figure out what Unai Emery likes to do tactically. I also think that this side, given its injuries, may not be capable of doing the things Unai Emery wants to do with the high line. Uh, and I think that you're seeing these results, especially against like classic counterattacking sides, uh, which Palace is right now. And I think like Unai Emery is probably going to have to adjust what he wants to do with that back line and maybe go back to more of a, a counterattacking style like he did those first like two or three months he was at Villa and he was just putting the midfield together. I think he's going to have to pull this thing apart and kind of start to scrap it back together with what he's got right now. Yeah, I think he has to be a little bit more pragmatic. Yeah. Do you think that do you think that Champions League, and, and I mean, I think they play tomorrow or Wednesday, I can't remember, but I think they have Juventus too. It's not like some small match. Like It is another yeah, massive week. match for them this week. Like, Do you think at some point they're just going to have to commit to one of these two competitions and try yeah. to push forward? And for the fact that they're doing as well as they are in the Champions League and you're there again and you may not get back anytime soon, like, doesn't – and, and and you might have the best knockout manager in all of world football outside of Carlo Ancelotti. Like, don't you almost have to focus on the Champions League and be like, we're going to do something special here in the Midlands, here in the England? I don't know. Like, so, like, I'll tell you what. Like, my philosophy on league over Champions League is, like, my opinion is, like, you should always prioritize the league, even if that means that you – like alienate your European competitions. And I know there's value in not only this, like the, the journey of a deep run in Europe, also financial ramifications. Right. But like, to me with TV money and the way the premier league is like, to me, if you don't focus on the league, like I think it deeply hurts your chances. Like to me, like the, the champions league is like, if you're going to make a deep run in the champions league, you almost have to have two or three years in the league in a row of placing into that competition to give you the opportunity to build the quality and depth you need to do that. Uh, oh, you're hundred percent fair there. I just more or less talk about like, I, my problem is this. I think this is a, such a competitive league. I think you can argue when you look and we're going to look at the table. Well, let's bring it up right now. 
Yeah, I, I mean, think you can. I think you can argue right now when you look at this table, right? That Brighton, with no European competitions, Tottenham, yes, they're in the Europa League, but like, I. I just feel like because Chelsea is resurgent and looks like a legitimate top four, like to me, I think Chelsea looks more likely to finish in the top three right now than Arsenal does, in my opinion. I'd argue Chelsea has a very good argument to say if anyone has a chance to get up near Liverpool this year, it might be us because we're getting better every week and the rest of the sides seem like they're coming down, coming, coming back to the pack. And I, I, I just think that that leads Villa to look at this and say, like, wow, if, if if Tottenham hadn't blown an opportunity to beat Ipswich at home, they'd be sitting in third place right now. Like, it, it this league is so tight. Even, I mean, Newcastle today, if Newcastle wins at home against West Ham, they're sitting in six, right? Like, and, and we have another team within striking distance. I just wonder if Villa looks at this and thinks to themselves, maybe we got there a year too early. Like we, we almost like Newcastle did two years ago when they finished fourth. They got there just like a peg too soon before the more investment came before the actual change. And I just wonder if Villa gets themselves like, let's say Villa can somehow finish in the top eight of the champions league. And they're guaranteed a final 16 spot. I think they look at that and they probably are like, yeah, we're rotating and starting backups in the Premier League on the weekends of those Champions League fixtures. Just because they don't know. I mean, it's been, it was 25 years since they were in the top competition in European football. I don't know that they can chance it happening again. I don't think they're Liverpool or even United saying to themselves I think like, this is going to be I think this is going to be very interesting because we've talked about like how bad the bottom of this league is right but I think what we're finding out really is how mediocre the top of this league is and so like for if I'm Villa right and I'm trying to want like yeah like I take a look at all these teams that are in the like battling for top four I also look and see we're only three points off the third <laughs> like you know what I mean so I, I think there's going to be some really difficult decisions we made. You could you could go either way. I'll be interested to see what they choose to do. Well, you talk about the bottom of the league, so let's take a look at the second half of the table, which, you know, again, you get all the way down, you know, to West Ham, Bournemouth, United, and Brentford between 17 and 15 points. I mean, these sides are still really within, like, if if you if City is still within touching distance of Liverpool, right? Then West Ham is in touching distance of City, and that that's when you and I you know I'm. It's it's, it's really like it is interesting. It's really a fourteen team league, though, right? Like those the bottom like the bottom six bottom bottom six are genuinely terrible. They are, but I will say this: I picked them to go down. Cause I thought it would get worse and I didn't think Cunha was this type of player. And I didn't think the 1800 guys with the last name Gomes would be able to keep them up, but I got to give credit where credit's due back to back victories should have gotten a result against city. That Wolves team, that Wolves team will be up with West Ham and them before we know it. And they won't be looking in this group. I think you are right. This is a 15 team lead. Wolves just gave everybody a 12 game head start. But I think Wolves will end up finishing somewhere in the 13, 14, 15 range. But you are right from Everton, Leicester, Ipswich, Crystal Palace, Southampton. That is, they are poor sides. And it's, it's sad to say that include Crystal Palace. The Palace thing is you have to when you have one win through thir- two yeah. 12 matches. I'm sorry. It's really sad to see that. Yeah, it's sad to see that team play like that, especially with the amount of exciting, you know, like Saar and Wharton. And they've got so so much like young attacking talent on that team that's fun to watch. So we talk about um, obviously, you know, sides at the bottom here, sides that are going to struggle. Obviously, we're going to have coaches um, 
coach is moving on and coach is changing. We had another one this weekend. Um, Steve Cooper let go. You know, in England, it's a big deal when you fire a guy on a Sunday. Like, that's a big deal. Normally, they wait till Monday morning. It's that whole, like, Sunday church just respect thing. Uh, they fired him on Sunday. Some people were arguing that that shows that they know who the next manager already is, that there was more of – it was kind of already in the cards and it was going to happen no matter what. Can you make heads or tails of the firing of a manager – off a 2-1 loss to a good Chelsea side? Like, it wasn't a terrible performance. They didn't get drubbed at home. Like, And why wouldn't you do it at the beginning of an international break if you were going to get rid of your manager? Sounds to me – I mean, this sounds similar to me, like the timing of, like, uh, some of these Mourinho fires, right? Like, I feel like there's kind of a conversation that happened and it ended very abruptly with somebody. Like, right. Like someone came in and said like, Hey, I want to talk to you about how the second half went. Yeah, he said, yeah. I want you to get the F out of my office right now. And they were like, we want you to pack your shit right yeah. now. Yeah. One of those? Yep. I think there was probably a conversation that didn't go the way that it naturally intended went South and, it, and they just made it a brief exit. And it's never been a good fit. Let's be honest. Steve Cooper didn't look like a good fit there. You know, Guy was a long-standing manager at what Forest, who is a big rival of of Leicester City. So yeah. right there, it wasn't like it was. A, it wasn't something that the supporters were ever in favor of. And I always feel like if you're gonna hire someone that the supporters don't like, it's gotta go well. Because once it starts to go off the rails, and the supporters are already like, "Go bleep yourself." It's a lot like when um, when Wayne Rooney was appointed at Birmingham. And everyone was like, wow, a big club like Birmingham just appointed a guy who's really kind of been an abject failure. And then all the Birmingham supporters were like, go F yourself, Fat Rooney, die. They were holding up signs like, we don't want Fat Rooney and like all these things. And then like he lost two games and they were like, yeah, so we're going to get rid of this guy with the next one. Like it just, if your supporters have given up on you before you ever start, you probably can't win a fire sale. And I think to that, he didn't have a chance. It sounds like there's talk of Rude Van Nisselrooy or uh, Graham Potter coming in. Graham Potter might be a good fit for Leicester, actually, because it's more of a project manager. Um, there was talk of David Moyes this morning. I was like, what? Oh, geez. But David Moyes is going to get a job this year. I do believe that because he wants to manage. But I think, you know where David Moyes is going to go? He's just going to go freaking – to Crystal Palace and basically be like, well, Hoy doesn't even know his name anymore. Great. So gonna, he can't come, guys. Can't but wait I'll to, help us play a 4-4-2 and ruin all the attacking prowess that we've created say, over Can't the wait to see that attacking, like, uh, that beautiful attacking team in a 4-4-2 with Fellaini in the midfield. Yeah, it would be great. It would it would be awesome. You'll have Adam Wharton trying to play the Fellaini role and Mateta trying to hold up like these freaking lovely things. It's just unreal. They're unbelievable. Um, just it, it, it would be outstanding comedy if David Moyes ends up at Crystal Palace. But so let's get on. We looked at the table. We looked at the teams coming up. Let's take a quick look at next week's fixtures leading into the weekend. Obviously, we have Champions League coming up midweek and, of course, the Europa League for those lucky enough to support a team that has to play on Thanksgiving. I will admit, there was those five, six-year period where Liverpool would always have a game on Thanksgiving because we were in the Europa League. And I actually liked it because it gave me an excuse to get out of my family Thanksgiving because I'd say, I got to go watch this soccer game. And they'd be like, well, we don't want to watch that. So get the hell out of here. We're going to watch the Cowboys or the Lions, which basically for anyone, basically tormenting at that time. So I kind of miss having those Europa League matches, but I don't. Um, next weekend, obviously the big one, Liverpool City, we'll talk a lot about it throughout the week here on this channel. Uh, and as well in our Monday night podcast, what else jumps out at you next weekend? As far as the fixtures go, what will you be keeping, you know, your additional eye on outside of the big one at the top of the table? 
Um, I'll be looking at this London Derby just because we have two teams that are all over the place. We talked about Fall Fulham, uh, like an overachieved for much of the first half of the season. They just come off a really bad loss versus Wolves. We see Tottenham, who has been all over the place. Um, you know, they had a rough stretch, then refound it, went on a really good streak, and it doing like obviously coming off the city win. I'll be really interested to see like which version of those teams show up for that match. Um, and then, of course, I think the other one that I'd probably be keeping an eye on here is just the Chelsea Villa one. Uh, Villa's got to figure out something here. Um, I think it's a pretty big match for them in terms of, like, you know, whether they're going to hang towards the top and fight for top four, top five. Um, and then, obviously, Chelsea needs to s- sustain their run. Yeah, I think um, I don't disagree with either of those being really interesting ones. That Sunday morning, what a good window that is at 8.30 with three really intriguing matches. And I, I actually believe as much as I banged on Everton earlier, I do think there's something intriguing and interesting here about this Manchester United-Everton match because, yes, United scores the goal a minute and a half into the Amarim era, and it looks great, and it's Diallo with a great run down the wing, and Rashford and a tap-in in the nine, and then they were abjectly outplayed for 85 and a half minutes to a team that will probably be relegated and should have lost the match because the best player is a player that your crosstown rival deemed as surplus to requirements and sold to a Premier League team that just came up in Liam Delap. He was head and shoulders the best player on the pitch. And the reason it's interesting to me, I won't be shocked if the game ends nil-nil. I won't be shocked if it ends 1-1. I won't be shocked, honestly, if Everton wins 2-1. I'll be shocked if United's able to put in a performance because I think this manager has principles that 70% of the playing staff at United can't live up to. And I think he knows it already. And I think they need a, like a massive overcharging. So it's going to be interesting to me over the next few months to see if he shifts his tactics at all and alters around the players he has. Cause if he doesn't, I don't know that he'll even make it through as long as Ten Hag was given. Like, people don't do realize they, do he, United has a yard sale in the summer for him. I don't think they can. And I think that's the problem. And I think they've made that clear to him. And he still took the job, which makes me think deep down he knew he wasn't getting the city job. And there wasn't another big job for him. And, and I think this was the time, and I don't blame him. You take the job that's offered to you because jobs aren't always offered. And it might work out, too, because shit can break there. They have good players, Garnacho, Ahmad. You know, you can work with the some of the center backs. Who knows? Maybe DeLitt works. I think the Euro kid's really, really good. Ogarte was one of his players. And let's be honest, the Jokerist kid was playing at Coventry and failed at Brighton before he became world-class playing under this man at Sporting. And all the skills he has are very similar to a young Rajmus Hoyland. It's very much the same profile player. He was at Coventry, that, that kid was at Atalanta before he got him. So maybe things work. My whole question is, is will United empower him to get rid of the players that need to go? Because that might be Casemiro, but that might also be Rashford. And I don't think they would ever let one. I think Ralph Ragnick and Jose Mourinho wanted to sell Marcus Rashford. And neither were allowed to by the club. And I think that's what holds that club back. That they have players that are more important than the project. So it'll be interesting. And I think it starts with like week two. How does he change? What? changes from it so it'll be really interesting but i am going to hit you up on this because it is a premier league show we have minutes left is liverpool winning the league yes i like that answer (laughs) what i'd also like is if every one of you listening and watching right now would get on over to the youtube page smash that like button hit the subscribe get on over to every other channel and outfit that we have uh let us know what we're doing well 
if there's something we can improve on, don't hesitate to give us that feedback. We do appreciate it each and every time you send it in. Um, for everyone here at American Scouser TV, thank you very much for following us, for watching the Premier League show. We will be back in action next week. Show probably coming out Tuesday morning as normal. Thank you and have a great week. We will talk to you soon.